Hey guys, thank you for joining us. Um, we thought we would try something new here and have more speakers than attendees. Um, <laughs> just kidding. That's one of the challenges of a conference like this is how do you handle launches that are embargoed until, you know, a couple of hours before <laughs> the actual session. Um, that said, we are super excited uh, to walk you through how we see IoT analytics, what Andy mentioned today, part of what if you were in uh, Dirk's State of the Union, you might have gotten a little bit of a preview of. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of those features, and, and um, we've got some customers here to tell you about what they're doing uh, with AWS IoT analytics, as well as you know, kind of their general perspectives, the types of problems that they're trying to solve. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, it being Wednesday at 5.30, it is Wednesday, right? Yeah, it's Wednesday, um, <laughs> at 5.30. Um, I, this is a relatively intimate group. I'm going to challenge Kip, who's coming up next. He's the product manager for this. So as you go through and he's describing things, if you have a question, raise your hand. Um, I know. Did you just see that? Just <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I'd like, to, I'd like to add just a little bit of interactivity if you have a question. We can also take things at the end as might be a little more traditional. Um, so here's what we're going to talk about. Analytics and IoT. That sounds like a very you know, mundane topic, analytics. OK, that could mean anything to anybody. And IoT, let's talk about anything to anybody. Um, turns out to be one of the biggest challenges in the IoT space. And IoT, you know, the Internet of Things, connected devices is starting to become kind of situational awareness for almost every industry that you touch. I personally come from a world, I'm a physicist by training, I started out in nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is one of those other ubiquitous technologies that started out like super cool. Every VC wanted to talk to me. It was awesome. Um, now everyone goes, nanotech. That's because, you know, gates have gotten smaller, right? We're at seven nanometers. That's good. I'm like, that is good. But it turns out it's probably in this carpet as a flame retardant. It's certainly in my clothing. Um, might be in the water because of part of the filtration processes. It's everywhere. We don't really talk about it anymore. Um, it's providing the value that it provides as part of a backdrop to the world we walk in. Uh, that's where we see IoT going. But in order to get there, all the cost of connecting these devices and managing these devices and over-the-air updates and all of the chips that you got to add in there, the extra battery you need to get communication channels, all of that is for one purpose, to gather the data, to turn that around, to insights, and then to be able to action it. That action might be something like a new feature on a connected device. It could be something like sending out a service call early. These are common use cases. Oh, wait a minute. How many people here are actually work in the IoT space? Am I preaching to them? OK, like everybody. So have you heard this before? Did you know that data was important, maybe? Yeah, OK, it is. Um, we agree. So what you're going to hear tonight is kind of Amazon working with our customers in order to better understand how we can make getting to that insight and to that ROI on IoT, how we can make that faster, simpler, cheaper. Pretty simple. Um, the underlying of how you do that, not so simple. Turns out a lot of analytics products that work really well in financial services and social media expect to have a certain amount of context about the data. They also like really nice, clean data. When apps create data, or even people, we're messy. But the data that we put out still comes in a pretty good format. The physical world, much more different. So we'll kind of walk through a little bit about what we see in that and, and where we've seen from working with customers where IoT is different and how we're solving that problem. Kip's going to walk you through the product again. Um, it's good for him. <laughs> um, he's really going to give me a thing if anyone asks him a question. Um, until after. And then uh, where you've, if you were in the State of the Union, you've heard from Chemo from Valmet. Valmet has probably the coolest devices I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, I haven't told him this yet, but uh, one of our, 
executive said, pulp and paper? Huh. Really? Are they doing IoT? I'm like, let me send you a YouTube video. Check out their YouTube videos. Like, super cool, just watching these immense pieces of equipment run an entire process as one unit is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and they have just really good high quality production video on their YouTube, so definitely check that out. Um, I'm going to talk with Eric from iDevices, because IoT is ridiculously diverse. And in addition to some of the heavy industrial use cases, the proliferation of devices is happening really from you and I. And iDevices has a heterogeneous environment that it itself is managing as part of a smart home. Understanding how taking a, a fairly simple device, right? We've had electric outlets just as one example. We've had that for a long time. How do we make that a new thing? How do we change the dynamic of usage? How do we make sure that that's driving new value? I happen to find that fascinating. I love business models. Maybe that's why I'm GM. Um, that or I stand on stage and, and move around a lot. Um, you've seen these three pillars, devices. Yep, got to have them. That's the things. Cloud also. If you've got distributed devices, there's got to be a place where you bring this in. The advantage of the cloud for me is that you've got tool sets that you don't have to build. You get to build on top of them. That means you're standing on the shoulders of giants. That's been said before. Um, not that I'm a giant. I'm only 5'6". But um, essentially, you get to work with the tool sets on a managed service like AWS IoT and extend into the value of your organization rather than having to spend most of your time doing plumbing. Um, turns out that's kind of hard, especially as you get wildly successful. And now every household has 10 of your devices. It's a lot of devices. Part of what we do is manage that scale. Intelligence, that's why we're here. Not because I'm intelligent again, but just because this is analytics, intelligence. So, I kind of already went through this, and I want to give a lot of room to the customers, more than me. Um, these are some of the areas. IoT, again, is in my world. I've been in this space for a very long time. I had a chemical additives business. I had mining on three continents. I had biomedical devices um, generating power from body temperature. There are many different ways to look at this lens, but eventually there will be a day when somebody goes, and you'll probably be seven. Well, why wouldn't you have a connected toothbrush? Of course you would. How else would you know about your gut biome and how healthy you are if you didn't have a connected toothbrush? Is there such a thing as unconnected toothbrushes? Um, in order to get to that world, though, <laughs> we got to analyze the data. So you saw the AWS Greengrass. Um, you saw our announcement about FreeRTOS, hopefully, as part of the SOTU or, or Andy's keynote. Um, this is kind of our world. This is where we get data from within the IoT ecosphere. Um, the IoT core and the service components within that. Uh, rules Engine is a particularly interesting uh, component in the analytics space. Um, it helps do some of that routing and transformation topics coming off of the Rules Engine is one of the feature sets you'll hear us talk a bit about. Um, IoT analytics also supports ingest from Kinesis. If you got a lot of historical data in S3, it turns out that's kind of usually a wealth of information, another key area. And I'll let Kip kind of talk about enrichment and context, because I think that's another area that um, it's what puts the data together with the rest of the environment. So with that, you're done with me. Congratulations. Ask him a question. Kip. <laughs> Thanks, boss, for putting me on the hook yet again. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Kip Larson. I'm the principal product manager for AWS IoT Analytics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why we identified the need for a product like IoT Analytics, uh, the features that comprise IoT Analytics. And then I'm going to introduce a couple of our customers that have been helping us out in private beta, refining the product, and uh, they'll tell you a little bit about their challenges, specifically with IoT data, and what they 
hope to accomplish with AWS IoT Analytics. So at its core, AWS IoT Analytics is a just a fully managed service that collects, processes, enriches, stores, analyzes, and helps you visualize IoT data at petabyte scale. That's it. Um, Let's talk a little bit about why we decided that we needed those specific things and, and what we actually mean by them when we say them. Sarah talked a little bit about why it is that we think IoT analytics is important. Uh, unlocking the ability to simply unlock a door with your smartphone or turn a camera on or off with a phone or trigger a motion sensor, that's important, but when we talk about creating the IoT economy, we want to build experiences where um, if I have a smart home uh, air purifier, I want that to automatically turn on every Tuesday night when my wife starts frying her favorite chicken, and not at other times. I want, we want to create business processes that allow us to inject intelligence into the physical world without the presence of human beings with their eyes on screens and fingers on buttons. And that means that we need to build models, uh, models that map the data that we collect from the physical world back to the actions we want our devices to take. Uh, and that gives rise to a set of requirements. We need a lot of data. Usually we're concerned with things that are rare, like when it is that my wife fries chicken or when it is that motor parts fail. And we have to accumulate data to scan through it. We need that data to be relatively clean. Because if we, don't, if we have data that's contaminated with outliers or data that's missing observations, the models that we build simply fail to train well, or they become oversensitive or undersensitive to new data. You get false positives or false negatives. That's undesirable. We have customers that we've talked to that have maintenance use cases that are deep underwater, where every time you have a false positive, you're telling someone to strap on a breathing tank and go down underwater to look for something that's not there. Uh, these models also need contextual information because oftentimes it's not enough to know uh, the data that's coming off of physical sensors. You need context about the world. That air pur purifier use case needs to know if I'm allergic to particulate matter. It needs to know uh, if I'm in a part of the country where plants bloom a uh, particular time of year that I'm going to be allergic to. Unfortunately, IoT data is almost a uniquely bad fit for these requirements. Uh, we get data at high volume, that's true, but the, the volume of data we get is, is inconveniently structured. Uh, the, great, the best example of this is the predictive maintenance use case. If you have a connected vehicle that's, that you're interested in monitoring the failure of vehicle parts, if you're driving a modern car, it fails only once every several years. So our data is rich in noise and sparse in signal. It also comes from multiple sources. Often our customers have fleets of devices that were built by different manufacturers. And the way that the data is coming in, typically on MQTT topics, is without any form of meaningful organization that makes it difficult to build models. It's also extremely noisy. People bump into sensitive equipment. They knock over vibration sensors, and then they smoke in front of air quality sensors. That contaminates the data with outliers and leads to problems. They also lack that vital contextual information because these are de typically devices with limited power. Uh, they don't self-identify their users. They don't identify the customers. Uh, if you have a moisture sensor in the ground, you can't tell if the ground is wet because you have a broken pipe or because it's raining. And so you have to address these problems. And so what customers are asking for are tools for dealing with these challenges. We, they need tools for collecting data from multiple sources. They need tools for pre-processing it, to cleanse it from outliers, to normalize measurements from sensors created by different manufacturers. Uh, they need to store that inconveniently high volume data that's dense in noise but sparse in signal. And they need powerful tools for building those models that they'll use to define those business processes and customer experiences that they want to create. And lastly, because you can't manage what you can't track. They want to inject IoT data into their business processes and metrics, uh, their metrics infrastructure. Now, in the absence of uh, workable, uh, of, a, of a managed service that does this, our customers are building this themselves. And they're creating architectures that, uh, and this is a real one, by the way, 
uh, the names of the characters have been redacted to protect the innocent uh, that are somewhat elaborate. And we've decided that we can take over some of this undifferentiated heavy lifting and make things easier. So we want to replace it with AWS IoT Analytics. And this is, at root, just a system that collects the data, pre-processes it, stores it, allows it to be queried out, analyzes, and helps you visualize that data. And it does so through a set of features that I'm going to talk about right now. We collect the data in channels. We process it in pipelines. It's stored in a data store. It's queried through a data set. We analyze it through Jupyter Notebooks, which we discussed a bit in Andy's keynote from this morning. And we support powerful visualization in Amazon QuickSight. Let's go through those one at a time. The channel is the entry point into IoT analytics, and it's fully integrated with AWS IoT Core. It allows you to combine information from multiple sources and topics, MQTT topics, and Amazon Kinesis streams. So you can apply organization and collect only the data that you need to in order to perform your analysis. After the data has been collected and structured in a channel, it's time to process it in a pipeline. And this is actually what I think is, is the most deeply exciting and interesting part of AWS IoT Analytics. The pipeline is a named, fully reusable component that is a set of processing steps called activities that can be applied to IoT data. We support a number of activities that generally fall into three different categories. You can filter messages that travel through the pipeline. So if you have a temperature sensor that says that the temperature is 50,000 degrees, uh, either it's inside of an, uh, of an iron furnace, or it's on the sun, or you have a broken sensor. And you can discard that as an outlier. Uh, you can enrich your data through cont using contextual information from the AWS IoT device registry, or Shadow. Or through our integration with Lambda, you can write your own Lambda function to enrich your data with any external information, uh, customer CRM data, weather service data, Anything that you can think of, you can enrich your device message data with. And lastly, you can transform your messages, either through regex, mathematical operators, or conditional statements, so that you can normalize information, readings from sensors manufactured by different providers, uh, or for any other needs, converting Fahrenheit to Celsius, and so on. The pipeline terminates in a data store, which is something that we've worked really hard on to optimize for IoT data. It's a time series data store. It's an abstraction on top of several other data storage technologies that we're continually refining that allows you to store significant amounts of data and query it at blazing speed. The way you query it is by creating a data set using simple SQL language. That SQL language can be run in a completely ad hoc way, or you can schedule a query to run and refresh any time that you want. The data sets are available through the AWS IoT Analytics console via API, export to S3, and they're also available, and this is, these are my favorite use cases, in the hosted Jupyter Notebooks that run, in, uh, that run on the IoT Analytics console and in Amazon QuickSight. So after you've collected and structured the data in a channel, processed it through a pipeline to get it ready for analysis, stored it so you're accumulating the signal, and sifted out that signal from all the noise using the powerful SQL language to create a data set. Now it's time to actually analyze the data and build that complex model that maps the state of the world today onto the actions that your devices need to take to build the customer experiences and make your business run more effectively. In order to help you do that, uh, we've built, we've uh, allowed the data set to you to click on a data set and load it directly into a hosted Jupyter notebook that's powered by Amazon SageMaker that Andy spent some time talking about this morning. Here you can apply um, powerful analytical and machine learning libraries from Pandas, NumPy, R, Scikit-Learn, MXNet, Gluon, TensorFlow, 
to your data in order to build models. You can segment your customer device fleet using k-means. You can predict the output of your uh, uh, out-of-productive devices using LSTM neural networks, or assign device health using factorization machines. We're really excited about the features that, uh, that are present using this technology because it allows you to finally build those complex intelligent models that are required to realize the potential for the IoT economy. And because once you've done all this, you actually need to track it and make sure it's working and make sure that it's serving the needs of your customers and your business, we fully integrate the data sets with Amazon QuickSight. So if you're an Amazon QuickSight customer and you generate data sets in Radiant, you can immediately have those available to integrate into your business process dashboards in QuickSight with no further work at all. Those are the features of Radiant, or AWS IoT Analytics. And we're very, uh, we're very excited about them. Uh, now, in order to, uh, to show you a little bit what the specifics of the challenges with the managing IoT data and what a, uh, they think AWS IoT Analytics can do for them, I'd like to bring up a couple of our customers to talk about their specific use cases. We'll start with Kimo from Givalmet, whose last name I will not attempt, uh, to talk about his use case. So difficult with my name. It's Kimo Rypsebakka. It's always been and hopefully will be. But anyway, so I'm coming from Finland, working for Valmet, um, and have been working with Valmet for one and a half years now. Before that, I used to work for Nokia for almost 20 years and last three years of kind of, of that for Microsoft. So how many of you have were in, in this uh, State of the Union IoT presentation? Kind of trying to decide if I want to go through this Walmart story and toilet papers again, but, but I was thinking that I will skip that and, and talk more about this, how, how we are utilizing AWS. But anyways, so Valmet, just briefly, we are making machinery for creating paper. And uh, so we are leader in our own technology segments. So we are making machines for making paper, board, so packaging material. I'm sure most of you have been using, like for example, coffee cups today. You have been also using tissue, so toilet papers. Most probably, pulp you have been utilizing because it's used for making the paper, and and so on. So, w what is unique in Valmet, kind of compared with our competitors, is that we are providing all this from this triangle, all this machinery, so process technology. We are providing also automation solutions for running that, those machines, and then we are providing service for supporting customers in running those both both the machinery and anti-automates. So we have been in this business for quite a long time. I will skip this. Uh, in, so we started 220 years ago on, on this paper business, but, but um, we have been working with automation since 60s. So, so out, originally they were analog devices, but I think in 80s we started with our first digital automation solution. But from, from industrial intent perspective, this automation systems are kind of a standalone industrial internet services. So there is a lot of devices connected to a network and, and uh, there is some uh, kind of intelligence in the, in, in the edge, so, so on, on this controller devices in, in the in automation network, and then there is some central uh, control systems as well. But looking at this new type of industrial internet or IoT, so you can also think that this whole system, this automation solution, is a very in intelligent um, edge solution. And then we are now building these industrial internet solutions um, by connecting these different in, um, automation solutions. So here is a slide telling little kind of how many installations we are currently having. So they are not really ours, but our customers are running those. But as in many cases, we are kind of taking care of them. So, so we 
kind of like to think that they are ours anyways. But it's nice that the customers are paying for our, our, our things. But um, skipping over this, so, so what kind of industrial offerings do we currently have? So we have this kind of data visualization tools, so showing our customers, enabling them to see that how their machinery is working, how much paper they are producing, and also anonymously compare their numbers with, with their competitors' numbers. Then there is this asset reliability optimization, so basically ensuring that the machinery will last until the next service break. There is a lot of things in this uh, paper production line which can go wrong. So, so I don't know myself even how many devices or kind of elements there are, but at least hundreds, if not thousands, depends a little how you split those in counting. And then this operations performance optimization, it helps our kind of uh, customers, but it also basically helps us to run, uh, the customers to run their environment better, so produce more paper with less energy or less raw materials. And then this Valmet Performance Center is a new service which we are launching with, together with this industrial internet services to our customers, so we are concentrating our best experts there, so they stay in, in place. They are available for our customers. They can connect remotely to those automation systems, but they can also now see then uh, data from, from this industrial internet services and compare the data with, with other similar kind of environments. So this is a technology stack with which we are, we currently are utilizing. So on the right, right hand side, you can see the kind of data sources. I'm sorry that the picture is so small. I was not planning to go it very thoroughly through, but thought that maybe I will talk a little more about this and a little less about the volumes. So, so on the right-hand side, we, we have kind of source systems. There can be individual measurement devices, which are then sending uh, data to the AWS cloud through IoT interfaces. Most of the data is however coming from, from this automation solution environments, either one of its own DNA or distributed network of applications, or then some of our competitor DCS solutions. And typically that data is sent with SFTP. And why SFTP? So many of our customers are kind of, a, the automation solutions are very isolated. So basic, and they can be also very old, like some customers are still running some elements which are built in 80s. So if it's not broken, you should not repair it. So, so that's kind of the principles there. So anyways, they are coming through the SFTP. And then we have some kind of business data coming from our CRM solutions and so on. And, any, uh, and then that data is taken to the storage area. We are using Redshift for most of the things. We are using Cassandra for time series data. Um, we are utilizing DynamoDB and quite many elements of the environment. And then finally, the presentations or the data is shown through the uh, business intelligence tool or dashboarding tool we are using first for that. Just last week, we had a kind of a review of the platform with, with AWS professional services. And we concluded that, hey, we have to change quite much this our design. So, Yes, you have right elements, but you should add a lot of more. So Spectrum, Athena, uh, Clue, and so on and so on. We have wanted to be, use this reasonably simple, but it seems that we have to add elements in, uh, maybe in order to ensure that the performance will be good. And it, there is an analyze box also under this visualization box, and that has been something what we were planning to concentrate next on. So, so our kind of uh, uh, production experts are very good in, in utilizing tools like SPSS or, or MATLAB and, and Python and so on. But, but we wanted to build these basic services first and then focus on analyzing. And we were then very happy to learn that Amazon is working on this IoT um, 
analyzed these services and, and now I hope that I don't need to care about this infrastructure anymore. I just can call Keep and tell that, hey, hey, I need these analyzing tools and, and you take care of the infrastructure and we can just push data in and they, they make the analysis and take the data out. Let's see how that works. So then about this our um, proof of concept case with, with the Valmet IT, uh, what? No. AWS IoT analytics proof of concept case with Valmet. So we selected, we, we had many options, but we selected basically this paper strength prediction because we had done that already kind of the prediction algorithm already before. So a paper production line is like half a kilometer long IoT device which is, there is something like 25,000 measurement points on the production line. We are trying to ensure to our customers that the production line is running smoothly. There is a lot of different things which are kind of utilized for kind of ensuring that paper quality is good enough and this paper strength is just one of them. So, okay, so, so I will go back. I forgot that I had this other slides here. Um, so this paper kind of this quality algorithm is basically just taking a piece of paper from each reel. And a reel is kind of a, a big roll where you are collecting the paper when it's product, uh, produced. So about once an hour we are taking a reel or our customers are taking the reel out. So there will be about 100 kilometers of paper on each of these reels. And here is a picture of this, how, how this kind of a data is collected from, from, from this production line. So basically it's in Valmet DNA historian solution. So, so the, the data, production data, and also the laboratory data have been already collected to DNA historian. This then shows that the laboratory data is shipped a little differently to the cloud than this process data. And then this machine message generator is just setting, sending it to two topics in IoT environment. And this picture tries to t tell about kind of how we are planning to utilize this uh, AWS IoT analytics in, in cleaning our data. So, so there are very small red points there uh, in, in this green line showing that when the reel has been changed. So we want to, and then because the paper kind of test papers in the laboratory, they are say, taken only from the very end of the, of the paper roll or reel. So the relevant data is for us only kind of 15 minutes before that um, paper roll is changed. So we want to filter out all this other data for this predictive analytics. Then we also have many cases where, where this, there has been changing something in the production line just before this, um, this paper roll is changed. And for example, if the production speed of the, of the um, paper production has been changing or this lip, has, lip opening has changed. So lip opening co controls that how much pulp is put on, on the, the production line at the very beginning. So, so if something kind of like that has changed, we want to discard these, these time windows as well for doing the predictive analysis. And finally, what we want to get out of that is that we, we are comparing this um, uh, real results with the laboratory results and, and kind of based on this our algorithm we are kind of analyzing that that we predict that the paper quality will be or paper strength will be something like this and then we are comparing that with the laboratory re results. From this picture you can see that we can already quite well predict the uh, paper strength quality but we hope that with the new tools of this AWS IoT analytics, we can do even better predictions, especially with the machine learning. 
but let's see how that works. So we will be pl we are planning to use this AWS IoT analytics in three ways. So first of all, running real almost real time, kind of based on the parameters measured from this production line, we should be able to estimate that now the paper which we are producing now is th has this specific strength. It's kind of uh, interesting for the operator. The operator is the person who is running the machinery. Then we want to, in the, in the kind of after each run, we want to get the laboratory results and see how well this our algorithm is working. And the third case, use case, is that we are improving this algorithm with, with the new tools from AWS IoT. And that, I believe, is all what I wanted to tell. Any questions? All is clear. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Kimo. And thank you to uh, all of you for showing up tonight, because that's particularly impressive, given that the pub crawl is going on at exactly the same time. So thank you. I am Eric Ferguson, Chief Software Architect of iDevices, and I'm here today to talk to you about insights and how we get to those insights from our raw data and how IoT analytics has helped us do that with really very little code and very little amount of time. To give you some context, we were invited into the uh, beta just a few weeks ago, um, and actually um, we have two proof of concepts up and running now uh, in really yeah, to be honest, most of the uh, work in those last two weeks was preparing for the presentation. <laughs> very, very little in terms of uh, setting up the pipeline and getting it to where we can actually use it to put it into Jupyter Notebooks to analyze the data. So I have my goal for the end of this presentation is that all of you have the knowledge and the confidence to go home, go back to your office, some go back to your hotel room, try this out for yourselves and see what you can do. Um, public service announcement, there will be a little bit of code in here, not a lot, AWS CLI, Python, but enough to show you how little there is to set this up and get to what you need. So I'll start with a brief overview of iDevices, what products we have, um, which leads to what data we have available, what our immediate use cases are for this kind of thing, uh, what our typical analytics use or uh, workflow is to get from the raw data that we have to reform it into something that we can use either in machine learning models or dashboarding. Uh, and then walk through two specific use cases. Uh, one, anomaly detection. Um, our devices are connected to Alexa, so uh, monitoring user performance on Alexa requests and getting a secret or getting notifications on when those fall out of range. And then a marketing dashboard to give our marketing teams a sense of how our devices are doing in the field and how our customers are actually using devices so they can use, they can take that and make better decisions. So iDevices, some people <laughs> know us as a grilling and cooking thermometer company. And while we did uh, start launched the iGrill in 2009, which was a Bluetooth cooking thermometer. In 2014, we pivoted to home automation uh, with an early access invite into HomeKit, and we're one of the original 12 launch partners. Fast forward a couple of years, we now have seven products uh, with more on the way that support a wide range of ecosystems and voice interfaces. So that's a source of a lot of our raw data, how customers are actually using the products. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have voice services. So how our customers are using these, that's another source of data. And then since becoming part of the Hubble family, um, Hubble, most people don't know, there are over 500,000 SKUs. That's a, a lot of products. We're certainly not going to put our technology into all of those, but even a small fraction of that, you can quickly see how the exponential growth of the amount of data, but more importantly, the use cases that we have to put that data to use. So in terms of our immediate um, needs, in terms of the insights we want to get from our data, there's the operational aspect. We need to know how our products are performing in the field. We need the ability to, um, the ability to detect abnormal behaviors and user traffic, device networks, device metrics, environment conditions. Uh, predictive maintenance is another one, being able to detect anomalies before um, failures actually happen. Business uh, metrics is another big one. 
because we need to know how our customers use the devices. We make a lot of decisions. I've been in a lot of meetings where a lot of people are very assertive about how our customers use our products. Once we actually take a look at the data, sometimes it's very different, and we need to know that ahead of time. And then lastly, there are other customer features that we can do by getting this information. So predictive scheduling, you think one or two devices, it's fairly easy to set it up into a schedule that allows you to, uh, when I'm going on vacation, have it turn it off, on and off automatically. When that scales to 20, 40, 100 devices, that quickly becomes unmanageable to where users really want, you know, <laughs> you're collecting all this data, I'm going on vacation for a week make my house look as if I'm actually there. So how do we get there? We talked about the sources of data that we have. We, have, we talked about the insights that we want to get from that data. But how do you actually get there? It's where a lot of people get stuck, including us, for a while. So let's walk through a typical analytics use case. You take in the raw data, and Jupyter Notebooks becomes, before you know, what's possible with the data, you need to know what you have. Jupyter Notebooks is an awesome tool for being able to do that, but more importantly, know what you have, but more importantly, what else you need. What data are outliers, uh, like Kip was talking about. Um, what other data could you add to it to enrich it, to make, to get uh, better inferences out of it. Um, Jupyter becomes a playground for uh, data exploration and enrichment activities, and this is actually prototyping the kinds of activities you want to do in the pipeline. So then you build the pipeline, build in all of your modifications, and then you store it in application-specific data stores. Not every model, um, not every application has the same needs. And then you finally trigger consumption such that it goes to a, the appropriate dashboard or machine learning model. So. Here's our current pipeline. We did have something before this. And like many of you, we did what a lot of you did, uh, likely did as well. We went to reInvent last year. And so we sat in on a session that talked about doing this kind of thing, um, where we collect data in from Alexa, goes to the Lambda scale adapter. We trigger a CloudWatch log event. Uh, we send that data over to another Lambda, which packages this data from a CloudWatch um, format into Kinesis Firehose. Kinesis Firehose delivers that over to Redshift, but not before taking a step through S3. And ultimately, what we want to get out of the data is we want a SQL access to our raw data. <laughs> that's ultimately what we want. And that's why we were particularly interested when we heard about IoT analytics, where all of that, which is relatively straightforward, but as you can see, much more verbose than what it needs to be. And then we were able to replace that with IoT analytics. So here's a blow up of the entire pipeline that we have in place now, but I have focused on the anomaly detection because it's relatively straightforward. Uh, data in, funnel it through the pipeline into a data store, feed it into anomaly detector, and then ship notifications out uh, to SNS. So here's some of the code I was talking about. So the first thing you do when um, you're setting this up, you need a place to store your data. So you create a data store. And the team has done a really great job uh, with a lot of the AWS CLI commands, create data store. You need to create a channel. You need to ingest the data uh, from, some, uh, from some input sources. So you create a channel. And then you connect the two of them with a pipeline. And then you specify the channel that you want. And then you specify where it needs to go. This is a case where you're just taking it in directly from a channel into a data store. You can add that channel is an actual array, so you can add the other processing steps in the pipeline, feed it to a Lambda function to enrich it, or add fil inline filtering operations or math operations. And then lastly, you need to actually get data in. In this particular case, we're pulling it in from an MQ topic. But as mentioned earlier, it can be from Kinesis or other data, store, data sources. You specify which channel it needs to go to. And then you need to query the data. And you can query it with uh, simple and powerful SQL steps. So here's the first use case, anomaly detection. Um, what we have now is a diagram like you see on the right. Um, and 
all it's really doing is graphing the data over time. And what it takes is a couple of skilled people who know how to read the graph and know who built the graph to know what to do. And if the person is there looking at it, then we know that there's a problem, um, which screams for automation, of course. So we've been asked a couple of times, we've been asked a couple of times, why not just hard code thresholds? And as you can see, um, in the diagram, we actually did hard code a couple of thresholds. However, um, and when it falls below that, we throw up a red line or whatever. However, when you take a closer look at this, you can see that it's on one of the least used <laughs> portions of the day. In a percentage, a simple percentage threshold like that, you get one or two failures and it can actually trigger. You actually look at the data, it's one or two uh, users who legitimately have Wi-Fi problems and they were, weren't able to do it. And of course, when you ask something of Alexa and she doesn't do it, you say it again, you do it a couple of times, it doesn't take much to clean that off or um, to trigger those. There are actually two of them. There is actually an anomaly in here that wasn't detected by here, but this is, in particular, this is the weekend usage, and there's a spike here, but there's also a spike in errors that doesn't show up on really any of the other graphs. So there's only so much that you can graph in 2D space. So that's why we, want, we look to anomaly detection um, which we'll go over in a minute. Let's take a look at one of the Python notebooks for this. All right, so I've got two Python notebooks. One of them is to visualize the data. So we need to take a look at the raw data, see what we have, and see what we can do with it. So we load load the data, set it up for query. We write a function to bin it into 15-minute bins, um, which we uh, have counts for a particular status or based on status code. We transform the data from uh, just those status codes into success, fail, success rate, but we also add in things like weekday um, and then whether or not it's an anomaly, and then we need to take a look at it. We can take a look, you know, that graph that I showed you earlier is good for one day. What happens if you take multiple days and overlay, or overlay them on top of each other? You can definitely see a trend, and most of them surprisingly, surprisingly uh, consistent in terms of what the pattern looks like on a daily basis. But of course, there are differences between the weekday that's on the left and the weekend usage on the right. Uh, and so models that are able to account for that time of day component. So you take a look at something that is anomalous, and you can quickly see when you overlay that what, where the anomaly is. And then you can graph, in this particular case, success rate and fail. Yes, this is anomaly for a considerable amount of time, 15-minute uh, bins between 0 and 20, effectively. There are other ways to look at it. In this particular case, I graph success rate, uh, which if you look at the usage, you can't see it immediately, but this one does stick down. Um, is very prominent. And so if you graph the total and the fail, you can see that spike there. That is also an anomaly. So with that data, we're able to, you know, I went through and hand classified, hand classified the data. We loaded in, we started with 19,000 historical, um, uh, historical samples, and then I hand classified 51 of those as being an anomalous. There are certain cases, in this particular case, um, performance actually got worse with the anomaly detector when I normalized it. However, a lot of times you will normalize the data depending on your uh, particular use case. And then you split the data into training, validation, and test sets. Uh, and then we define the model. For a, multi a multivariate Gaussian distribution model, there's really three inputs, the mean array, the uh, covariance matrix, and the value of epsilon, which you can use to tune how sensitive it is to detecting anomalies. So we generate the covariance matrix and the mean. We define the multi-Gaussian function, um, and then we run it, comparing it with the threshold. Um, and then, so in this particular case, we ran it through and took the max value of the output of the Gaussian function, and that will define a threshold that says everything, um, everything below that or everything above that is anomaly, everything below that is not. And so we wanted to optimize it for recall, which gives you no false positives. So everything that was defined as an anomaly is detected. However, you can see that there are 66 false positives. So in our particular case, we, 
we, and depends on your use case for us, we didn't want that high level of false positives because as anything, the more false positive you have, the more likely you are to ignore it. So you can use Jupyter to graph different epsilon values over time, and then as you can see, the re as the recall goes up, precision goes down. That's a balance and trade-off that you have to make uh, with a lot of machine learning models. And so we're able to pick based on this graph an F1 score, try to get the highest precision and the highest recall available. Running it again, we get three false positives and two false negatives. So we did not catch those two. However, we can look at those and determine whether or not those were in, or, uh, improperly classified or not. So this is, uh, let me switch it back. So this is actually deployed and running, and uh, um, it's funny sitting through uh, uh, the keynote this morning. I actually got a couple of uh, uh, couple of text messages from it, so it is actually running and working, and that's doing precisely what we intended it to do. There are all kinds of things we can do for future extensions. Uh, this is just the beginning, so we can experiment. We can add in other features uh, like latency, in particular. Um, we can do failures per customer because that's another uh, metric that could lead to um, give us some insight into something that we're not doing correctly. Um, and then experiment with new features to help out with make better correlations. Um, we can deploy this uh, a similar anomaly detection in other domains like monitoring our backend servers and then with other architectures, uh, neural networks, to see if they can determine better correlation between input features, but also even uh, a little over a week ago, I had seen a paper talking specifically about unsupervised real-time anomaly detection. So rather than having someone like myself going through all of these logs and hand classifying everything, um, having an algorithm be able to learn this in real-time and flag anomalies. So use case number two, marketing dashboard. Operations is great, but another facet, op or, um, another facet is um, as I was mentioning earlier, the ability for marketing to have the data about how our devices are actually running in the field because a lot of marketing decisions and sales decisions are made based on uh, what features are used and um, how often they get used. Um, uh, <clears throat> and really embarrassed to admit that uh, for a long time there was really no clear linkage between real customer sales and uh, customer usage. You know, dev teams are typically focused on new products and the lift associated with building the linkage uh, falls lower and lower on the priority list. So uh, we took the IoT analytics opportunity to show what could be done with relatively little effort. Um, and so what's the current state now? As I had mentioned, not a whole lot. So here's the rest of the pipeline where we're taking in real device usage, coupling it with the Lambda, or Lambda usage, storing it in multiple data stores, querying it, and then this is actually going to a quick site dashboard that we built for our marketing teams to actually take a look at this data. So let me show you uh, a Jupyter notebook associated with that. So similar, a lot of basic initialization, load the data sets, you can take a look at it. Um, every single Alexa request that we ingest in, uh, we have the device ID, the user, the duration, the results, whether it's successful or failed. Um, we have um, all the different devices, the name of the device, uh, the version it was running, uh, et cetera. And then we're able to build graphs like this, like daily activity. So this is, um, the request per day over a six month period. So this is between April and October. And you see a very, of course, a very interesting trend here where around July timeframe, there's a drastic increase uh, in acceleration in the request per day. So, you know, we're able to take a simple linear regression, fit a line to it and see that on average, day over day growth is 364 um, for a relatively long period of time. So. Why is that? <laughs> By actually seeing this like that, we can start to ask those questions and then take a look at other data and try to, try to see where that's coming from. So plotting a similar data but breaking it out per device, we see that you know, for the most part, 
most of the devices um, usage stayed fairly flat, except for Indoor Switch, one of our, f our first product that we launched. So around that same time frame, the number of requests coming in for those devices also drastically increased. Um, and then you can see the device population that we currently have with, um, for our Alexa data set heavily weighted on Switch. Now, you know, this is where we give this to our marketing guys and they, they can use couple it with their sales data uh, and try to figure out why that actually happened. So we did put switch on sale around the same time frame. Is that the reason why or are there other reasons to do that? So this will help them do that. You can also get other interesting trends like daily active users. So around the same time, daily active users fit a line, fit a line to it, uh, 56 users per week increase over that four month period. And then monthly active users, that has a more steady growth um, or a longer growth, doesn't have the flat on the other one. And then because everyone lo loves word clouds, we had to throw that in. This is the um, a heat map, essentially, of the most popular names in lamp, <laughs> light, floor lamp. A lot of these are used in lights, which is other, um, another interesting thing. Top end users. So, Top end users by activity. It's interesting to see some of these things where there is the top user only has 11 devices, where there are other people that have far less. Down here, um, we'll see actually in a second, the top user has 156 devices. So even though he has far more devices, other people are using this uh, on a regular basis. Um, top end devices by activity. So there, this one particular device by this one particular customer has been used almost twice as much as the next guy. Um, but this Benton Court, these names have been anomalized to protect the uh, innocent, of course. But um, Benton Court in particular, he's the top user, uh, and he uses his bathroom lights <laughs> fairly evenly throughout the day, 1,400, um, over that same month period. And then, Top devices by users, so how many devices do our users have? <laughs> because these names were anonymized, it's not actually Santa. He doesn't have 156 devices, but that is very interesting to see that large gap. There are people running these large, large, uh, uh, large installations. And here's an example of the uh, QuickSight dashboard that we have built up where we have um, unique users, um, let's see if I can point that, unique users per month, uh, unique devices by month, uh, number of requests per month, requests over time. This is turn on off requests versus every other request <laughs> that we have through Alexa. Uh, on off is certainly far more, uh, uh, um, far more prevalent and then request per device. And with that, I will turn it back to Sarah. Thank you. That is uh, pretty much our content. Um, we do have exactly two minutes and seven, six, five, but nobody interrupted Kip. So, um, <laughs> this is your opportunity, unless you want to ask him afterwards. Um, do you have any questions, comments, wants? Hey, guys, you didn't add X, because there are a couple of people with yellow badges that are just waiting to take those <laughs> PFRs. No? All right, well, with that, you get an extra one minute, 36 seconds to drink beer on the pub crawl. Thank you guys very much. Really appreciate coming in in the evening. <laughs>